every business, however big or small, should be producing content on a regular basis because your rivals are producing content. And if you're not producing it, you're letting your rivals speak directly to your customers. With Hey everybody, my name is Andrew Tran. I'm a marketing branding strategist. I help organizations, their teams, their team leaders deliver and execute on the challenges they're facing from marketing campaigns to market entry activity all the way through to strategy and planning. If you want to hit me up, check out my website. It's www.andrewtran.asia. You can find out a little bit more about me. You can book time with me. But until then, let's get on with the show. My next guest is Nick Bendel. He is a professional digital marketer. Uh, he specializes in content development and creation for small to medium sized businesses. With a deep background in journalism, he's currently a director for Hunter and Scribe, a digital marketing agency based in Sydney, Australia. Nick is absolutely smashing it on the LinkedIn game at the moment, creating some really engaging content on the platform. Anything to do from his three minute marketing series all the way through to his 500 lunches, his quest to kind of meet 500 people all across the globe. We had an amazing chat. We dive deep into his mindset as an expert communication content creator. We also looked at his journalism background degree. He dropped some serious, serious tips and knowledge with regards to improving your content creation, making it relevant, reliable uh, to your audience as well. But without further ado, give it up for Nick Bindel. Nick, how's things going? What's going on? Andrew, so great to be here with you, mate. Mate, things are going really well here in sunny Sydney. I, I know, I know you're, you know, you're a guy on a mission today um, as well. And, you know, for people who are watching and listening today, like the theme of our conversation is around uh, communication, content and context, right? Um, and for those who aren't familiar with uh, your work, would you mind like letting everyone know a little bit about you and, and your agency and what you guys do? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I run an agency called Hunter and Scribe. We're a content marketing agency. So we we do writing for, for small businesses, mainly blogs, social media posts, ebooks, and emails and media releases for small businesses. And for small businesses, do you look at specific industries? Is one industry better than the other in terms of the work that you kind of do? Most of our clients are in property and finance, Andrew, but we do work with clients in a full range of industries. What I've discovered, and this was before I set up Hunter and Scribe, this was during my days as a journalist, it's far more important to be knowledgeable about writing than about a specific industry because you can quickly learn about a specific industry because everything is available on Google. So as long as you have knowledge about writing and about being able to express yourself clearly and communicate clearly, you can write about Pretty much anything. Wow. Okay. That's a really cool segue into, I guess, the first question I wanted to ask you about communication um, and how you actually firstly got into journalism and why journalism in the first place. <laughs> I, I wish I could tell you I, I had a good answer. So what happened in my final year of school, I knew I wanted to go to university, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to study, Andrew. And in New South Wales, where I'm from, at the time, you had to nominate your top six preferences. And I had no idea what I wanted to do. And my mum said, Nick, I reckon you'd like journalism. So I said, okay, why not nominate journalism? So I nominated a media degree and I happened to get into it. And my mum was right. I love journalism. I love media. But I didn't plan to do it. My mum planned it for me. Oh, wow. <laughs> but hey, you, you loved it because you, you stuck with it for a long time. You got your degree. Uh, do you find though, like now that you've kind of, got into like the marketing field, content writing from that, did you feel like um, the fundamentals that you learned in journalism kind of helped you prepare you for this moment from a content writing perspective? Absolutely, Andrew. That is such a great question. Absolutely. What you learn in journalism is how to gather information, how to analyze that information so you identify what the key point is and then how to present that information clearly and concisely. And if you want to do effective content marketing, Andrew, you need to be able to gather information. You need to be able to understand 
which part of that great mass of information is the key information and then you need to be able to present that clearly and concisely. So the lessons I learned in journalism are serving me so well today now that I've left journalism, but I'm involved in content marketing. Yeah, nice. And with that in mind, do you sometimes, I don't know, like, I don't know if you do or not, but would you sometimes go back into journalism, like write any long form elements just to kind of keep, you know, keep your skills up to some degree? Is there anything like that that you do from a writing perspective? Yeah, I, I, I would say, uh, Andrew, journalism basically involves two parts. So the first part is gathering the information. Often that's calling someone or calling several people. And then the second part is presenting that information in an article. So these days in content writing, I'm not really phoning anyone to gather the information, but I am still doing that second part, which is writing the information. So I'm writing every day. Sometimes it's short posts for clients. Sometimes it's medium length blog, sometimes it's long ebooks or feature articles. So the good news is I am still doing that journalism style writing every day. Yeah, nice, nice. And with that in mind, like when, when you, you know, with your, with Hunter and Scribe, which is your agency at the moment, and looking at your website, like uh, you focus on, on content writing, website design, uh, sorry, websites and design. Um, with that in mind, like, do you find, what, what, are, what are some of the common things that you see that small businesses have when it comes to, in terms of challenges, when it comes to clear communication? Ah, uh, so the key part of that question, Andrew, was clear communication. So the, the big mistake that a lot of small businesses make when they communicate is that it's not clear. And the reason it's not clear is that they often don't think of the audience when they're writing they often write for themselves or for other people in their profession but the people reading your content it's not yourself and it's not other people in your profession it's customers and if you want your customers to to understand your industry you need to write about it in very simple terms you need to avoid jargon and you need to avoid acronyms and you need to avoid confusing language so the big mistake people make the small businesses make, Andrew, when they put out content, is it's not clear. And I, I wish I wish businesses would maybe pause for a little bit before they publish content and just ask themselves, would this be clear to a customer who doesn't know anything about our industry? If the answer is yes, fantastic. But if the answer is no, you probably need to go and edit your content to make sure it is clear. Nice. That's a really good, that's a really awesome answer. Um, you know, I, it, it's funny how, well, it's not funny, I'm sorry. It's awesome the way you just mentioned putting, understanding, writing, putting customers first. And I think that is a fundamental when it comes to marketing as a whole, because what we see uh, brands do, whether or not they're large or small, is sometimes they're, they're so focused, they put so much energy on this product or service when it comes down to the communication there's, there's sometimes a disconnect between the product and probably the customer. And therefore, like as a communicator, it becomes a little bit difficult when the product manager tries to uh, dictate, I guess, communication flow when they don't necessarily have the right information uh, and context to really understand the customer and their journey through you know a buy sales element so i think that's really cool the way you've just explained it with regards to uh putting customers first especially in in a in a simple thing or not a simple thing but in a skill set such as writing uh, a piece of content whether or not it's social media whether or not it's an ebook or even you know redeveloping a website creating the right language the tone of voice coming through i think that's that's a really cool thing um for anyone that's listening or watching, we, we connected through LinkedIn and I found it really interesting because I looked at your profile and went, wow, this guy has an amazing following at the moment. Um, and obviously I, I want to dive into how you actually cultivated it, but I feel as if the way you've cultivated it uh, has, has to do with uh, this kind of three minute marketing and, and 500 lunches that you've kind of been working on. Would you mind be able to kind of give everyone a little bit of a explanation around that, how you kind of came up with that concept? 
Yeah, sure, Andrew. Well, th there are three types of content I, I put out. So the first one, I do these daily videos and the daily videos are 60 second videos and they provide marketing tips. The second thing I do is three minute marketing and I do that with someone named Joy Abdullah and Joy is based in Malaysia and funnily enough, I've never met Joy. We connected over LinkedIn and became great friends and I've learned a lot about marketing from Joy. So once a week, we publish a three minute video about marketing. That's the second thing I do. And the third thing I do, Andrew, I'm in the process of having a lunch with 500 strangers in five years. Uh, I've had 86 lunches so far. And every time I've, I, I have a lunch, Andrew, I write a post about it and I publish it on LinkedIn. And so from those daily videos, from the three minute marketing videos I do once a week with Joy and with these 500 lunches posts, it allows me to, to build a brand and to get in people's feeds every single day and just to build some trust and credibility with people who might become customers or referral partners. Nice. Nice. It's, it's, you know, you're, you're teaching people how to apply your methodology uh, with regards to communication and you're applying it yourself, which is awesome as well. So not only do people see, your own personal content, your own personal branding, but you're able to kind of reflect that when you start consulting and delivering for your brands as well. And I think that is such an important thing, whether or not you're a small business or even a, a large you know, enterprise business, whether or not you work for an organization or you're just working on your personal brand, I think the content that you push out um, and the, the ideas that you come about it is so um, it's so important as someone, as a marketer who like watches from afar and sees great things that are happening. It's not, you know, it's not the Bloomberg's of the world. It's not, you know, it's not the WeWorks with like the multi-million dollar budget. It's, no, it's, it's people like yourself who, hey, you've just got a laptop or you've got a phone and you're having a conversation. It's a pure communication dialogue that's happening at the moment and you're just creating some really uh, great content that provides value on a regular basis as well. Um, just a quick one, like when did you start, uh, when did you start all three of those kind of initiatives? The daily videos and uh, my 500 lunches, they both started in August last year and the weekly three minute marketing videos that I do with Joy Abdullah, they started in October last year. Wow, okay, so a good eight months, eight to, no, eight to 10 months. Yeah. Nice, nice. And have you seen, like, do you, when you publish those articles or publish those videos and you hashtag, do you go in and community handle as well? Like, do you go into those hashtag conversations in like that other people have been posting and communicate as well? Like, how do you, how do you then like, I know you produce the content, you push it out, uh, but then how do you try and, galvanize engagement from you and uh, others. So, so that's a great question andrew and i just want to pick up on on the key word you use which is engagement because if you want to succeed with with social media it's not enough just to publish content although that's so important because by publishing content you build trust and credibility and brand recognition with people, but that's not enough. You also need to do engagement. And for those who don't know, engagement means interacting with other people's content. So that means liking their posts, sharing their posts and commenting on their posts. When you comment on someone's post, it not only is a way for you to demonstrate your expertise and show off your personality, it's also a way for you to build a relationship with someone. So I mentioned earlier, Andrew, that my collaborator with Three Minute Marketing is Joy Abdullah in Malaysia, who I've never met. Well, me and Joy built a relationship by reading each other's posts and liking each other's posts and commenting on each other's posts. And over a period of maybe six months or so, we, we got to know each other and like each other and feel like we, we had some values in common. And so that comes back to what you were talking about earlier, Andrew, engagement. What you need to do is you need to engage just as much as you post you need to find some content to engage with now it can be doing what you mentioned which is clicking on a relevant hashtag or it might just be 
people who come up in your feed, but you do need to be engaging every single day. Nice, nice. And, you know, like when you, when you started this, um, obviously it was more around just like just building credibility um, and pushing things out. What out of all three of those kind of content pieces that you write, um, what have been some of the amazing if you can recall some of the amazing kind of uh, results coming out of it. Well, one thing that I like, Andrew, is I will be talking to a potential client and a potential client without any prompting from me will suddenly mention, oh, Nick, I've been watching your videos or I've been reading about your lunches. And I will be surprised because this person has never liked any of the posts or commented on any of the posts so i had no idea at all that they were consuming the posts. so so that's one thing andrew that's really appealed to me i've I've learned a valuable lesson which is for every one person who likes or comments on your post there are probably another 10 people who are secretly consuming your content so the content you put out has a much bigger reach than maybe you realize and so I'm always really excited when I'm talking to someone and I've got no idea that they're consuming my content and they just happen to mention it. It's always something that I find really exciting. Nice. It's that, that really cool rippling effect, uh, you know, when either people engage with it or, or just invisibly engage with it, as I kind of say as well. So I think it's kind of cool. Um, have you seen like through your stuff? I'm really interested in, sorry if I'm pushing into it, but I'm really interested in the stats um, more in particular, like what do you find uh, that is more engaging, like video posts uh, with the three minute marketing or the one minute ones or um, text with text and, and imagery with the lunches that you do. When I do a written post, mm-hmm. the written posts seem to get five times as many views as the videos. However, I think that the videos have a much bigger Mm. impact. And here's why, Andrew, when you you watch someone's video, because you're looking at them face to face, your your brain believes that you're actually chatting to that person live and and having a relationship with that person live. Your brain doesn't register that you're actually looking at a screen. So you feel like you're building a relationship with that person. So when someone watches my video, they they feel like they're chatting with me. They feel like they're interacting with me. They don't have that same impression when they're reading one of my blogs. And so even though fewer people look at the videos, I think they have a much bigger impact I think because people feel like they're chatting to me or or engaging with me, they feel like they're building a relationship with me. And so I think video allows you to build trust and credibility so much faster than text-based marketing. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point that you just mentioned, like, uh, and, and actually correlates to something that I'm hearing through a couple of my buddies as well, is that text gathers up, uh, enables more better engagement but video uh helps from a brand focus perspective and allows that kind of uh i guess i call it like humanization between Mm. you and and the audience in itself because they get to hear your voice they get to see you um talk and and explain uh their expertise coming through so i think i think the way you have just explained it is such a a precise way of, of of describing uh, the nuances between uh, like, you know, text versus video. Um, and, and I like the way you've kind of mixing it up as well, uh, to kind of see how, which one kind of works. So I think that's, that's really cool. And I think, I think as a, and, and maybe I would love to get your thoughts on it as well, like for small brands or even large brands, like mixing it up is so important because you've got different audiences with different needs, uh, different personas, different way they interact with media. Um, I think it's just really, really important to really kind of do that. I mean, what's your thoughts on that when it comes to mixing it up uh, on content? I do like the idea of mixing it up, Andrew, because some people prefer to take in information by reading it and other people prefer to take in the information by hearing it or, or watching it. So by mixing it up, you're 
making your content more accessible for a wider audience. Yep. Yep. Indeed. Indeed. Um, hey, just jumping along, I know because obviously the big elephant in the room for everyone is COVID, right? And for small businesses that you, you primarily kind of focus on, do you, what's been the change with regards to the way um, small businesses have approached marketing pre COVID and possibly how they approach it post COVID? Like has, have you seen a bit of a difference? Well, with marketing, marketing, Andrew is a discretionary expenditure. And so when a downturn arrives and this goes back, not just in the past few months, but decades, centuries, the, the first thing companies do whenever a downturn arrives is they cut their discretionary spending. So a lot of companies will instinctively reduce or completely eliminate their marketing investment when a downturn arrives. So when this coronavirus crisis arrived, there were some companies who instinctively got nervous and thought, let's reduce or eliminate our marketing expenditure. And I completely understand that thinking because when you don't know if you're going to survive, it makes perfect sense to do something that seems likely to help your chances of survival. My concern, though, with that action, Andrew, is people don't put money into marketing just because they like marketing. They put money into marketing to make sales. And if your marketing is delivering sales, then why would you stop or reduce the marketing? Because if you're putting $1 into marketing and getting, say, $3 back in sales, well, the worst thing you could do then is to reduce or eliminate the marketing. So I think that's a mistake, but it is something I can understand. And so one thing I've noticed, Andrew, is since this crisis started, companies have been less willing to invest in marketing than before the crisis started. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And it's, it's something that I've seen as well when I look at my clients and also when I speak to my other agency friends as well. It's like, you know, uh, that knee-jerk reaction to, you know, hold spend straight away. Uh, and, and one of the things that, uh, you know, I've explained in, in a couple of videos beforehand uh, is that marketing, advertising spend should still continue, but there should be an audit with regards to your, you know, the, the customer's needs or the hierarchy of needs because they have completely changed. Like the customers that would have purchased said product, said service will have exactly in your, in your mindset, like, you know, described it as either a, a necessary, a necessity or discretionary type of product or service. And therefore the way they interact, the way they are more, susceptible to marketing to messages to communication will be completely different and so some of the communication that i've said to my clients or to some of my friends is that marketing is still relevant and like you just said use the analogy for if i'm using marketing to generate sales and i get you know a three to one type of uh, ratio scenario with regards to every dollar i spend i get three dollars back yeah the last thing you want to do is take that back because that's that's three bucks you lose straight away you know and even if the downturn is happening the like customers have changed their perception their, their approach to products and services the way they spend money discretionally versus necessity uh you know you're still putting like it's it's still just optimization like you're putting in money to optimize you're putting in money to learn um, to see how your product is still being relevant within the marketplace. So I think it's so important uh, for brands out there, whether or not you're large or small, to still be uh, allocating funds when it comes to creating content or uh, advertising, if you're, if you're an advertiser straight away, or even upskilling. Because I noticed that you know, you're having a, quite a lot of organizations downsizing. So not only downsizing the budget for marketing, for, for spend, but also downsizing uh, CapEx as well, like you know, headcount. And so I would also be looking, if I was a business owner, like a small to medium business owner, even a large business owner, looking at ways where I can 
tap into learning and development funds to upskill my uh, my marketers, my my personnel, mm-hmm. so that they're a little bit more savvy um, and they could potentially create content and then leverage uh, the the great content pieces that you push out with your one minute marketing, with your three minute marketing uh, videos. uh, And, and then when it comes time to actually engage with a biz, like with an external agency, it becomes, you know, then you're ready, you're set, you know, the, the job is, is um, much more easier for you as an agency because then you're like, great, you've got this great piece of content. You're, you're driving, you're still driving in traffic somewhat. Let's optimize it. Let's look at ways to optimize it. Instead of creating something new and going through a testing phase and all that, um, you, you're just going straight into like phase two, which is optimizing. Um, this actually brings me to another thing, right? And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I have asked a few of my friends, you know, personally, which is how, if, if I was a brand and you're talking to me as, as I'm a business, how should I prepare for an agency when it is time to bring in an agency or external personnel to help me out? Like, is there, is there a, an advice that you probably give to businesses when it comes to like, hey, this is probably the best way to engage whether or not you want to bring me on as a, as an external provider or not. Like this is probably the best uh, way you want to operate your business uh, so that, uh, you know, external agencies or, or anyone that you bring aboard can help you out. Is there anything that you kind of suggest when it comes to that by any chance? Yeah. Well, what I'd say, Andrew, when you're hiring an outside provider, whether it's a content marketing agency or whether it's, a plumber or a painter, that outside person or company cannot read your mind. So you need to be crystal clear as to what it is you want them to do. For example, if you're hiring a painter, you can't say to the painter, just go and uh, make that room look nice, Andrew. I need to tell you what room I want you to do And I need to tell you what color I want you to paint it because you're not a mind reader, Andrew. So I would say to businesses out there, if you're thinking about bringing on an agency, you need to understand exactly what it is that you want the the agency to do. And then you need to be able to explain it to them clearly. If you don't know what you want them to do, they're not going to be able to guess. So before you hire anyone, just get it clear internally exactly what you want to be done and then express that clearly to whichever agency you bring in. Nice. That's a good way. And the only thing I would add on top of that is, um, you know, I would also say that as a, as a brand, uh, you know, as a small business, the more that I need to spend explaining to an agency, it's almost like a lawyer. The more I have to spend my time with a lawyer, the more I'm going to get charged. So if I can prepare <laughs> as much as I can to give to an agency, then they're going to be able to produce the work efficiently and effectively as possible. And then the turnaround time is much quicker. So I, I think that's a, you know, what you've said uh, is, is so important. Um, hey, look, I, I know jumping, just touching on a little bit more on the COVID situation, you know, I've seen quite a lot of big brands pivot and do some fantastic things to help the community out. Yes. It's a bit of branding, but it's also like it genuinely help out. So you see, you know, Brands convert their warehouses into, uh, you know, making sanitizers, for instance. Uh, I, I have a, a friend of mine, a buddy of mine here in Vietnam, they've converted, they make, they manufacture hats and, and, and T-shirts and they've converted that into making masks. Um, albeit they're making a lot of dollar out of it, but it, it's kind of cool the way they've done it and the way they've been able to quickly pivot. Uh, and I've seen a couple of small things with, with some smaller businesses as well, but I'm just wondering with, with your expertise uh, in the field of small business, like, have you seen any really cool examples of small businesses pivoting? Uh, yeah, actually, funnily enough, one of the people I had lunch with, a, a wonderful person named Raj, who has an AI business called Immersify, he realized that suddenly everyone around the world wanted PPE, this personal protective equipment. And so his AI business started 
producing PPE, even though it's old school manufacturing and has nothing to do with AI. He realized that there was an opportunity there. And now not only has he suddenly got a new revenue stream for his business, but he's creating a product that is bringing so much value to so many people around the world. That's probably the best pivot I can think of. Wow. That's cool. That's really, really cool. Um, so I think as we're kind of finishing up, I think it's really important for small business, for anyone listening out there, like whether or not you're a small business, you're a medium sized business, whether or not you're an owner, you're, uh, you're a manager or you're a leader. Uh, what, when it comes to communication context, uh, what, a uh, couple of practical tips that you recommend any prospect or any client that you talk to when it comes to communication? So I, I would say a few things, Andrew. First, every business, however big or small, should be producing content on a regular basis because your rivals are producing content. And if you're not producing it, you're letting your rivals speak directly to your customers without any sort of input from you. The second thing I'd say, Andrew, is when a business is putting out any form of communications, you always need to see things not from your point of view, but from the customer's point of view. The language you use, the words you use, the tone you use, it always needs to be designed to be relevant and interesting and helpful for your customers. The two big mistakes I see businesses make are first, they don't publish content. And then second, when they do publish content, it's what I call self-centered content. It's content that talks about themselves or focuses on their own needs. What they should be doing instead is publishing content that their customers consider interesting, relevant, and helpful. Nice. Thank you so much. They're so useful, uh, especially like understanding your customers uh, and, and creating content that's relevant and reliable for them as well. I think that's so, so important. Um, so for Nick, like for anyone that is trying to reach out to you uh, professionally, personally wise, what's the best channels to reach out to you with? Two ways. People can contact me on LinkedIn, Andrew, or they can email me. My email address is Nick, N-I-C-K, at Hunter and Scribe. Hunter, H-U-N-T-E-R and A-N-D, Scribe, S-C-R-I-B-E dot com. Great. Thank you so much. And for anyone that's listening or watching, I'm going to put all of his details in the show notes in the description. So don't worry about it whatsoever. Nick, thank you so much uh, for your time and, and the gems that you offered. Uh, and for everyone else listening uh, and watching, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers. Bye.